Hello, my name is Ishtar. I had an NDE at the age of 13. And my story starts sometime a little bit after my birth. So I have to start my story around my birth just because it sets up the whole thing in a very strange way. I, I grew up in a little town called Lake Geneva, Wisconsin. Uh, I actually had a, had a strangely stable existence uh, compared to a lot of my friends in, in which I uh, was in my crib, was in my bed, and graduated high school all within the same room. Uh, in, until leaving leaving home. And I had a lot of interesting things which I didn't think were interesting when I was growing up. For instance, in the crib, I would have people who weren't part of my family walk through my room at night. And, and some of these people would walk through the closed doors and walk through the back wall. And as, as I wasn't afraid of these because I hadn't yet learned the concept of ghost or spirit or any of this stuff, I didn't know enough to be afraid, but these things were happening. And uh, thankfully, I, I, I had parents who, uh, as I was growing up and learning about these sorts of things and these sorts of perceptions, uh, they allowed these things to kind of be in the category of the imagination, which was great because then these things didn't shut down. So this sort of stuff happened through childhood here and there. Uh, of course, as you get older, these things kind of start to, to fade out. Uh, maybe the most important thing that, that didn't fade so quickly uh, was something that I even took more for granted and thought was even less interesting than these, these strange visitors who would come in my room and, and want my help in, in going to their next destination. And the interesting thing, which comes up later in the NDE, was a sense of unity with everything. I, I even remember when I was first learning language and I was learning pronouns, I was learning how to say, this is me, this is you, all these sorts of things, chair, box, you know, learning the, learning the nouns uh, for everything around me. But even as I was learning those things, there was a sense that I was in those things. I would look at the shelf and there was a sense that there was no boundary between whatever I was and whatever the shelf was and whatever my crib was and whatever, whoever my mother was. Um, I knew there were differences on the surface and I would, would watch myself have, you know, regular child temper tantrums at a skin knee and, and other things or not being able to watch Ghostbusters when I wanted to watch Ghostbusters, for instance. Uh, and, and yet behind all that, that activity, there was this peace. That was the most important thing about that, that unity, which I took for granted. There was this, this deep sense of silence and peace back there. That, and there was a sense that somewhere in my heart, there was a door that just went forever and ever and ever. And, you know, that sense started to fade out around age seven, going to school. And so like, like most kids, I was, uh, you know, trying to be, you know, loved, liked, important, do well, really an exhausting operation that that we, we all put ourselves through and and so you know I was I was doing that and I think by the age of 13 I have to say I was getting pretty good at playing that game which isn't necessarily what the universe had really wanted me to develop fast forward now to June 5th 1997 I was playing the last because funnily in Little League we had preseason games which to me makes no sense Anyhow, I was playing the last uh, Little League preseason game, and uh, I got hit by a pitch, a, a real zinger of a fastball. I got hit by by a pitch uh, right here, and uh, I, I proceeded to to go and pitch the next inning with with this pain right there. Uh, and then after uh, after practice or after this this game, I, I we found out that I in fact had a broken arm, and and so we we had it in a sling. So that night I was distraught, you know. Uh, because the baseball season was one of the highlights of my year. I did very well uh, at it, and it was a place I could shine. And and so, oh, my God, I was distraught. And I was talking with my mother, you know, kind of calming myself down, getting used to, you know, adjusted to my new life that I would have half the season that I wouldn't be playing or something like that. And then all of a sudden, as I was talking to her, uh, I found moving out of my mouth the words, are, are you going to die soon, Mom? And they they came out of my mouth with... I didn't think about think them. They just came out, and there was a real power to them. And and I remember it even affected my mother, who really had two feet on the ground. She was that type of person. She was a fairly fairly formidable person, strong minded, very together. And so to see her be momentarily affected by these words as well was was something that I registered. And and so I, you know she quickly shook it off, whatever 
she registered, you know, registered uh, affecting her. And, and she, then she said like, no, I'm not going to die. And then she corrected herself. Well, I'm going to die someday, of course, uh, but just not for, for um, a while longer. And she, she promised to me that, you know, for as long as you need me, I'm going to be around. And so I felt, okay, you know, that's great. I can, I I can shake this thing off too. Whatever came out of my mouth, a little bit of background. I was, I never had this fear about my mother ever. She was, she was fairly healthy. And, and th this never crossed my mind as, as an anxiety. It wasn't, it just wasn't there. So that's, that's made it extra surprising to have it be there. And so I went to bed, uh, relaxed. Um, I woke up the next morning, uh, like a cartoon character, almost trampolining up out of bed uh, as if I possessed suddenly some secret, uh, ninja muscles that you read about. And uh, I, I was also panting uh, as if I'd just gotten uh, done with a race, as if I'd just run from somewhere into my body, really. And, and uh, at that moment, my, my mother and my father were walking outside my bedroom door, which, which I always kept open on kind of the ghosts. <laughs> I kind of felt comfortable having an escape route. That's funny, but that's why I did that. And so I saw them outside the door and, and, you know, they were like, what's wrong? You know, they could notice I was you know, panting and, you know, really distraught. And I said, there's something I have to tell you. There's something I have to tell you. Uh, and I was so frustrated because I couldn't remember what it was I was supposed to tell them. And I was like, I can't remember it. I was really, re and they, they had to spend five minutes because I, I was so distraught, they they had to kind of calm me down, and and tell, I'm sure it's fine, <laughs> you know. And so then they went off on their morning walk. This is about six a.m., something like that. They went off on their morning walk. I got ready to go to school. I went to school, basically had second to the last day of school. Come home after, after an easy peasy day of no no work and you know, award ceremony and stuff like that, and and we're sitting on the couch and we're watching a movie. No, no, nothing going on there. Then we we drive my sister off to her uh, new job location, which was kind of on the edge of town, a new movie theater they just built, and we drop her off there. And as we're pulling out, leaving the parking lot of the movie theater, we're kind of going across one of these uh, two and two lane divided highways that you find a lot. And we, we drive out and, and you know, there were some cars over there and, it, you know, they, they were well down the road and going slow. So there was no sense of danger. Uh, I was turning my head to talk to my mother. I think I was about to complain about how I didn't want to listen to Luther Vandross again. No offense to Luther Vandross or anything. And and as I was doing that, there was a, a large car just about to hit us. Uh, a big Lincoln Continental or town car or something like that just about to hit us right right outside the 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 driver's side door of our little chevrolet and at that moment and instead of freezing in fear i i didn't have enough time to think two thoughts uh, consciously the first thought was shit uh because it seemed fairly in my mind it seemed apparent that this was the end of this lifeline you know <laughs> this this was it because the thing must have been going 60 65 miles per hour is really big car going fast and um and the next thought was was actually instead of freezing up and tightening up i became so loose i became progressively loose in, in that millisecond or whatever it was and i thought i i really thought that this life was going to go longer it was kind of you know, I, like almost like i was talking to somebody like i thought this one was going longer like if you're reading a script or a novel or something like that and then all of a sudden, it, I was completely overtaken by this. It almost felt like a physical process. Uh, but I started to have my entire life flash before my eyes, which was something I was always curious about as a youth. When I read about that, I thought, how is that possible to have all the information of a life go? And there we were, uh, except it was greater than I, I, I was imagining it. It was every single moment in a seamless loop. So it seemed, of course, you can be skeptical of this, obviously, and, and maybe you should be, but every single moment uh, seamlessly, uh, only it was more, as I experienced in this place, it was more than I, I had experienced in most of those moments. And most of those moments, I realized in this process that I was either, I was half asleep at best. Some of these moments, I think I was about 75 to 80% asleep to life and to, to what was going on, really. I had no idea how much I was missing, even as a as fairly unstressed 13-year-old. And as I went through this process, it was as if I was connected to a completely wholly objective 
aspect of consciousness, which I had experienced in early childhood frequently, and which I sporadically experienced after age seven, because I often didn't like what it would tell me. <laughs> uh, you know, I'd, I'd have these these plans, and it'd say, probably a bad idea, and be like, shut up, you know, I'd go do the plans, and it would be a bad idea. A anyhow, here I was in contact with this, with this thing, and Every where, where there was fear, where there was uh, where I had acted with pettiness, where where I was holding some kind of grudge that I wasn't releasing, all of these things that that uh, you know were were shown to me to basically be the the instruments that actually blocked my full experience of life, were were, were coming up, and were being forgiven in some way. It, it, it the mechanism forgiven is I, I can't even put words to it because it was it felt physical as if. As if my heart was was being my inner body, my heart, my soul, all of it was being massaged by love, you know. And and so here we were, we were going and going and going back. I, with thirteen years, it's not exactly a long reel of tape. Uh, <laughs> we're and, and we're going through every moment. There were moments where at once I was I was roughed up which was uh, felt, you know, like that was a rough moment. I think that was psychologically affecting, uh, picked on and roughed up and, and thrown into a chain link fence, uh, face hitting it. I, I remember in, in that moment, I was connecting to this other, maybe you could say higher aspect. I, you could use the word higher self if you want, aspect of myself that was fully present there. I was saying like, and, and its perception of the moment was completely different than my stressed out one because it was going like, oh, this is fantastic. Oh, yeah, this is great. This experience right here is going to be a great thing to heal later. They totally set this one. And I was like, and, and, and you know, parts of my more limited consciousness that were kind of starting to merge with this were going like, really? Good Lord. <laughs> you know, okay. And, and, and so there we were going. And, and as we moved backwards, there was this, there's this complete sense of being, uh, merged into, I could say love, I could say light, I could say being. Really, any word that you put to it is is um, a poor facsimile into this profound oneness, uh, which which was being revealed in in the life review as the core constituent of all experience. And so, as as I matured in this life review with this guide, I was seeing that everything that had ever transpired to me, every molecule in in every scene of life what was in fact informed by an intelligent love the whole time and i was also doubly experiencing that that the real me that the real pronoun i should be using was not limited to this to this sort of body mind of its biography but in fact the real me the whole time was actually in, in everybody and everything all at once even in the buildings of the inanimate objects the real what i could call real Calling the biographical self real in, in the light of that that experience was was a was was silly. It was so limited, and and so here here we were. Then then the tape ends, and and there was this fascinating sensation as if as if I had a skin that I was wearing my entire life suddenly pulled off, and it was an invisible skin. Uh, and, it, and it was massless, except it felt like it weighed the weight of the world. And it, it, this this complete sense that I, that, that I was carrying around all this weight of, of, of fear, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And now it was gone. And, and so back in real time, I haven't even been hit by the car yet. It's one of the reasons I, I, I barely ever considered this an NDE because I'd watched that film uh, Flatliners. And I was like, oh, man, that shit's intense, man. I, I didn't have any of that, that stuff going on. But um, I hadn't been hit by the car yet. And the, I, this was the most alive I'd ever been in my life to that point, in some ways, except maybe some parts of early childhood, uh, was sitting there waiting for, you know, waiting for the physical death and having it not matter one iota because I was realizing that I was all of life everywhere. And it didn't matter. I was, I was in my mother's shoulder and her head that I could see. I was in the car. I was in the clouds in the distance. I was in the... The, the driver who seemed to maybe already be drunk or unconscious or something as he was approaching us i was i was i was everywhere and 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 nowhere all at once and and more than that i realized that i i was being massaged actively by by love coming from everywhere it was the the, the largest thing i could imagine as if as if somehow 
we have to go to William Blake, eternities in a grain of sand. There was a sense, of like almost like a holograph, as if as if somehow everything that I was looking at was infinitely packed, far greater than 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 the scene of life. And what that was infinitely packed with was this this vastness, and oh, how how wonderful! And so then you know, boom, we're, we're hit, uh, impact is made. I remember um, quickly being thrust to my right and knocking my head into the uh, uh, the, the glass of the, the, the window of the car door. Why well, I didn't have a bruise is beyond me, but that knocked me out, uh, you know, cold. That was, that was a, that was a concussion. And, and then I wake up um, and it was, you know, I wake up to the sound of the seatbelt, um, bing, ding, ding, seatbelt, um, uh, bell going off, uh, people outside the car, EMT workers approaching the car and getting their, uh, giant sort of, uh, skill saws out to, cause the doors didn't work, have to cut the car open to get us out of there. Yeah. Um, my, my mother was, uh, clearly, um, you know, fighting for her life. Uh, lab- labored breathing. I was concussed, so none of this was really registering all that much. I didn't. I didn't know what my name was when they took me out and put me on the the gurney. And they're like, "What's your name?" It's like, I have no idea what my name is, but that's my mom over there. So it's like that's what I knew. It's like that's my mom over there. No, and and nothing else. And so they're taking us. They did a very fine job of making sure they didn't have any spinal injuries. They were real pros. I could tell that. And uh, got us out. Got us in the ambulance. We're speeding away. I'm experiencing that thing that later I read other people have where you're you're both in your body and you have you're also looking down at your body. So I was I was kind of, you know, I never I didn't look both ways. So I couldn't, you know, look look at my own eyes or anything like that. But I was up there and they're they're working on both of us, much more my mother, because I seemed to be okay, which was you know, not bizarre because her car got hit, but uh, her side got hit, but I I don't know how I got up there. Uh, the only injury besides a concussion that I picked up from that accident, ironically, we were going to the same hospital at that time, which was bizarre um, for me, a bizarre coincidence. We were going to put a cast on my broken arm and uh, I broke my middle finger. So I went around the next summer with a cast for a little while, which looked like this. Uh, so cast on the arm and the little you know, flange buried that that was completely poetically fitting because of course i went through that elizabeth kubler ross anger stage for a good uh, a good amount of time uh and so that was a perfect reflection of, of, of a big part of how it felt anyhow there's a digression back back to the scene we're in the ambulance she calls my name out a couple times uh, i say twice i'm okay mom she doesn't register the first one she definitely registers the second one i know that because um, her her breathing shifted from being um, broken to calming down, and that was in probably the most touching moment of my life in many ways. And one of the things that informs every other moment that comes after. Uh, to witness somebody staying inside a broken body to make sure that their loved one is okay. That, that was, that was it. And when I said that the second time and she, I, her breathing changed, I felt a whoosh go by me. I didn't I didn't think that that had anything to do with my mom not being alive, alive in a body anymore. But I was up there, you know, up there at the top of the ambulance. And uh, I had felt connected to her up there. Like, so when she spoke, I could hear it through these ears down in the gurney. But I, I heard it more directly I don't know, in my soul or in my mind or in that extended mind that was up at the top. There wasn't a sense of a difference between her and I in many ways. And then I felt that breeze softer than the whoosh, more of a time was really kind of, you know, compressed the sense of it. And we ended up at the, at the hospital and she was being uh, cared for, uh, worked on behind the curtains. I was out, they, they figured I was pretty okay. I was still sort of strapped down in case I had spine or neck issues. 
And and um, then we heard the news, you know, your, your mother's gone. And that, of course, was the hardest thing, hardest sentence I'd ever heard in my life. Maybe ever will. And so, you know, then it was just tears, not, nothing mystical there, just, just tears as you walk out of the hospital and the Lutheran social service, well-meaning Lutheran social service people kind of try to try to hug you. I didn't really want to be hugged um, at that point, just, you know, walked out. And and so you know the the, the following days uh, were kind of just sort of happened, and and maybe after about a week, I, I can't say that things normalized, but after about a week, I started noticing um, strange things to me. Um, my mother had I think Elizabeth Kubler Ross's book on death and dying. I think that was the book that I was reading. My mother had studied to be a um, a therapist. And so we we kind of received a second head education early in in um, ideas of therapy and psychology. So at least I benefited from her library, and I could I could clock the stages of grief that I was going through. I was like, okay, that's happening, you know. <laughs> and not only was I not afraid of anything uh, in, in a way that I had never experienced before, that I felt weightless. First, I thought what I was experiencing was shock because I felt all this joy and bliss coming out of my inner body. I also was back in in childhood in a way that didn't feel like it was in childhood, but was more augmented. There was silence everywhere inside me, it, all around me. It felt like the back of my head wasn't there in a, in a good way. It felt like if I closed my eyes or if I simply moved my attention back, I found myself in an endless space. And whenever I would put myself in that endless space, bliss would run up through my body and and i would i started experimenting with that i could do it in my heart as well i could do it down in my stomach there were there were doorways and all these places and i would find myself falling back into them and falling into this vastness i remember one time i wanted to talk to my ask my dad about this i was very cautious about sharing this these inner things because it, you know there was a deep part of me that said don't share it with anybody, especially the adults, because they probably won't understand, and that'll 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 probably uh, stultify what you're experiencing. That was that was sort of an inner guidance. So like, okay, that's probably that makes sense. And I was about to say, Dad, are you experiencing this joy? And then, you know, just as I said, Dad, the answer was he's absolutely not. So I was like, okay, we're not going to talk about this. And uh, this was there mostly on a little bit off sometimes through a couple months it was there at the same time that i was pounding my fists against the garage wall in anger and and pleading to be given my mother back it was there at the same time where i would i would wake up um, in the morning hoping that the, the last however many days had just been a dream and that i would be waking up you know June 6, 1997 again, and yet this this peace was still behind everything. And so that was that was a different sort of thing. Uh, eventually that faded. I, I went back to school, I went back to eighth grade and and I tried to um, I suppose I tried to be the person that I was before the NDE uh, in a way. And in some ways I was outwardly seemed successful at doing that. There were a lot of things that I had been pursuing that, that I achieved, I got to be student, you know, little things. And I got to be student body president. I was treasurer of this and secretary of that. I got an award for education, the president's medal for education, all these things that that I had wanted. And and, and most of them were, were in a sense fairly meaningless, which was a shock to me. I don't know why it was a shock, but it was. And, and so I, I spent about a year maybe trying to fit into my old skin which which was now ill-fitting totally ill-fitting and then one day i was walking with my big sis who i who, who i love so much and and i would you know go to places i wouldn't normally go to like different sort of shops that bored the hell out of me i would just go along as a dutiful younger brother you know maybe learn something and and so i went we went to a metaphysical bookstore and i had no interest in metaphysical bookstores up to that point in my life and as i associated them like, i don't want to go to an incense shop with weird you know like wind chimes i don't need incense or wind chimes little did i know so i went in and i went in the back of the room and um in in the back in the back room was 
uh, a book I picked up at random. It was on Himalayan yogis and their experiences. I opened it and started reading a page at random. And it was share, it seemed to be sharing to me all those experiences that I knew weren't shock that I had been experiencing about a year before. And I and I read through it and read through it. It's like one page after the next, one experience after the next. I was like, oh my God, that that dimension they're talking about, I, I must have tapped into that. It's like, whoa, okay. So I suddenly became very interested in the metaphysical bookstore and, and I would come in often to try to read this or that different book. And, and I started to get a sense, maybe this was why all this happened to me. Maybe this was why I saw it beforehand. I always had a sense that it was kind of part of the plan since I saw it beforehand. In some way, I thought, okay, there must have been some kind of plan. Why the fuck would you take such a wonderful woman away from the world? And why would you take my mother away from the world? I, I, I have to make this worth it in some way. That was how I felt at the time. I thought, she's such a wonderful person. I don't know if I'm ever going to measure up to um, her impact in the world. I, I have to do my best. I'm not saying that it's necessarily a, a, a good motivation to have, but it was there. That's what, what a big part of my motivation. So I, I went into this bookshop, tried to learn as much as I, I could, uh, wound up being mentored by people who, when I was around them, I was suddenly taken back to that, that place of presence that I was experiencing so deeply in that summer after my mother died that I had been in childhood. And I was just doing everything I could to get to that place. And, you know, that, you know, that was the rocket fuel for, for the next few years of sort of being a, maybe I think a bit of a lazy um, high school spiritual seeker until my junior year and um, which the jets came on. Uh, later, I, I always had wanted a connection with my mother. I wanted to experience her spirit. I mean, I experienced so many rando, rando spirits in my life. I was like, why can't I meet my own mom? You know, it's like, and I, I begged for it. I pleaded with, with the universe, nothing. And then I went to this, you know, meet your spirit guide workshop at the bookstore. I only had to pay like five bucks, you know, as a, as a kid. And, and, you know, apparently I did meet them. I, I rocketed out my top of my head to this room and they were, they were beings were talking about my, life trajectory and then they looked at me it's like what the hell are you doing here you know, come back down and they're like i'm, I'm sorry but you're not going to meet your mother's spirit for a while it, it, it's it's part of the plan it's like oh shit you know and 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 so i was like all right okay I, I'm, I'm i'm cool with that at least these spirit guides you know they, they must you know have a good idea of what's going on and bizarre experiences in this life by the way and and that was you know that was that for a while and, and I, I went and became a, a heavy meditator and put in long, long hours, had an ascetic period, um, found a practice that I, that I still do now called Ascension Meditation during a monastery. I was in my meditation teacher training, and this was a period in which you put in long hours of meditation every day for about six months. So it was about, I don't know, two-thirds of the way through and I was walk, taking, walking to the bathroom. Sometimes I would bloody walk with my eyes closed, which was silly, but I knew the hallways. Uh, and I was walking to the bathroom. I came into the bathroom, looked in the mirror, and uh, it was in a non-scary way. There was my mother's face merged into my face. And it wasn't a sort of biological similarity sort of thing. It was her face in my face and her, her presence, which, which I, you know, when you're around someone, they have a certain feel to them. I'd forgotten what her feel was like. And there it was. And and it was just total like, you know, you did it. That was the sense that I got from the face looking back at me. You 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 ran the obstacle course. This was this is where you were trying to get. You did it. And you know, that was profoundly healing because I kind of uh, made myself a bit of a black sheep by by uh taking my particular life course of you know becoming some kind of sketchy monk in oregon instead of you know you know i don't know going and becoming a lawyer as quickly as possible and you know years later i had another encounter with her i was on my honeymoon it was significant because as a 12 year old and a 13 year old and 11 year old I, I would take walks with my mom and she would often say you know i really want to get back to i want to go back to amsterdam and florence and she'd say yeah florence is my favorite city in the world so when you graduate high school I'm, I'm going to take you on a trip before you go off to university. We're going to go to Florence. You're going to, you're going to experience the city that touched me so profoundly. Of course, we never got to take that trip. And, and so there I was 
not even necessarily consciously informed by those conversations, just I wanted to go to Italy on my honeymoon, so did, so did my wife. And one of the cities was Florence, and there we were in Florence. And it ended up that that I, I had to climb uh, Giotto's bell tower uh, alone. My, my wife had an ankle injury, and, and so she wanted, me to, she wanted me to go climb it. It's like, okay, I'll do it. And as I was climbing this tower, I, I realized I was looking out this window. I was all by myself, which was great. Looking out this window over the the hills around Florence and the 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 dome of the Duomo next to it, and I, I smelled my mother's perfume. There's nobody around. It came out of nowhere. I didn't remember what her perfume smelled like, but as soon as it came up, I, I remembered all those memories from um, childhood, and I felt her presence, and I felt I uh, felt an arm around my shoulder as I looked out, and I realized that. Since the stairs are so narrow, I'd, I'd, I'd in fact obviously been treading the very same stairs that my mother had tread you know, some 42, um, 42 years before. It's a little coincidence, you know. Maybe somebody uh, had the same perfume. I, I don't think so. No, there was nobody around me at the time, and so that was that was a, a profound moment. I don't know. The purpose of these stories is, you know, in some way that that there's connections. Uh, in all sorts of different ways that are open all the time. I think the most important part, what if if I if there's some deal between my mother and I to push me in a certain direction, it was that um, I think what she was seeking in a certain way uh, was the same thing that I I sought in a more heavy way, which was freedom, which was the peace that passes all understanding. I think that's the core uh, the core import. There's a lot of important and interesting things about your death experiences, but I think maybe at the core of them, at the very bottom of that experience is, is a underlying unity that frees one from existential suffering. There is a profound peace that the more we contact it and the more we bathe in it, um, transforms our lives in ways that we, we often, frankly, don't think can be transformed. And so... That that is my NDE. I never left the other side, and I don't even like to call it the other side. I think that's actually, uh, you know, if there's a quote in the Bible, the kingdom of heaven is is within. You know, the kingdom of heaven is here and now, and the kingdom of heaven is within. That's that's the other side is here all the time, and it's not another side. It's 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 our essence so i'll leave you with that uh, you don't have to have an nde to find this place you can find it in all sorts of ways you can trip and fall into it we do all the time abraham and aslo called it the peak experience and i think the core of the peak experience is the core same core as the nde maybe not as intense sometimes but it, it can be it's there and your your deepest meditation that you've ever had where you were in pristine you know total total silence and totally everywhere that's the same territory that we're talking about here so I invite you to that